Um, my name is Jasmine Wahi. I'm a curator and a gallery owner and a professor um, at the School of Visual Arts here in New York City. Um, and what I teach is uh, intersectional feminism and art making practice, which is a lot of things. Um, so to start, I thought I would read these two short things um, before we go ahead and start the actual presentation. The first is a quote that I used to describe my class, um, which is for master's candidates um, who are working in multidisciplinary art practices. Um, and this quote is from one of my favorite books. Um, which has been really formative in my practice as both an educator as well as a feminist and an activist. Um, it's from Bell Hooks, Feminism is for Everybody, Passionate Politics. And it reads, most people have no understanding of the myriad of ways feminism has positively changed all lives. Sharing feminist thought and practice sustains feminist movement. Feminist knowledge is for everybody. And the second comes from a recent interview that I did um, with a online publication called Gallery Girls. Um, I have a hashtag that has become pretty popular, I guess. Um, I like to think it's popular because I use it. <laughs> um, but in the interview, the interviewer who is, whose name is also Jasmine um, says, I've been following you on Instagram for years and your custom hashtag badass brown chick first comes to mind. In your own words, why are you a badass brown chick? My answer is, I think at its root, badassery is about being unapologetic and unabashed about doing what you want, how you want, when and where you want, without worrying about the repercussions of oppressive social standards. To be totally honest, I am tickled by the idea of being a badass brown chick because it's such a conundrum within the stereotyped perception of what being a good model minority, South Asian American cisgendered femme is. For better or worse, and perhaps to the chagrin of some, I've never been able to fit into that mold of the model minority. I am far from demure or polite. I don't care about politeness. And I speak out against what I think is inherently wrong or oppressive to either myself or others. I am probably obviously not a medical doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, nor am I married to one. I am, as my mother, who I think is on this webinar, can attest, abysmal at math, and I have been known to burn the simplest of foods, including rice. Being a first-generation South Asian American who grew up in the 90s, I think I fit a generational mold that constantly probed and prodded into fitting into these tropes. In my limited life experience, it seems that the wider acceptance of South Asian American, Asian, black and brown people doing anything outside of the imposed stereotype is still very novel in the mainstream. Even now, the imposed perception by the mainstream, which is typically oriented around whiteness as a construct about being a person of color is extremely flattening. We as people of color become monodimensional to fit into a box or a series of segmented boxes. A badass brown chick is in some ways oxymoronic and unconventional, and that's more or less how I see myself. So let's see if we can go ahead and start the actual slides. All right. Hmm. I mean, it's still showing up blank. Should I share? Should I share from my Google Drive? 
Yes, I think we can go ahead and do a screen share. Okay. Because uh, we're already into this and it's so interesting so far. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me figure out how to screen share. Screen share. And uh, wait, let me just try something really quick. All right, now, screen share, here we go. Okay, now let me just present. Can you all still see, Amina, you can tell me, can you see the presentation? No, I can't see anything, it's blank too. That's weird. Uh, let me see. Let me. How about now? No. Okay. Something is happening. I yeah. See, actually, uh, I'm able to see the presentation. Naya can see it, Jada can see it, so we can all see the presentation. Oh, okay. Okay. Can, let me just, before I jump right into it, um, can you still see it now? I can't, but if everybody can, I think we can go ahead. Please just let us know in the comment box if you can see the screen. Yes, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. So since I'm presenting through this mode, I actually cannot see your comments or if you have questions. So if maybe someone could um, just chime in if, if someone has a question midway. Um, I will let you know that in my practice and whenever I do talk, I'm very informal. So um, if anyone has a question while I'm talking to you, either just chime in um, and I will answer it however I can. So let me go ahead and start. Um, as you can tell, uh, I really like Bell Hooks from the quote that I just read, which is also the title of my talk, Feminism is for Everybody, Divesting of Intersectional Oppression and Becoming an Intersectional Leader. Um, I'm going to talk about intersectionality very shortly. Um, as what the def formal definition is, as well as what my definition is. Um, but before that, I will go ahead and tell you a little bit about myself. Um, this is a still from a piece that I recently did for um, NBC, and it's a short video. The link is at the end of the presentation, um, but it's basically me talking about my own relationship with cultural heritage through the lens of fashion. Um, so to jump right into it, what do I actually do? Um, I am, like I said, a business owner. I own two businesses um, that are in the same location. One is called Project for Empty Space, which is a nonprofit gallery located in Newark, New Jersey, um, that also does projects basically all over the world. And our purpose is to involve the community in social discourse through art. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. I also, in the same space, run a project called Gateway Project Spaces, which is uh, studio spaces for artists. Um, and I have about 46 of them um, that I run with my partner, Rebecca Jample. Um, I'm also a professor at the School of Visual Arts. I am an activist. I am an intersectional body positive feminist. I am a brown artist advocate. And occasionally I write when I feel so moved to do so. Um, the image that you see on the right is from a protest that I organized this summer. It was the first artistic protest that I organized um, and it was against the uh, pervasive phenomenon of rape culture, um, which 
is basically talking about how speaking in a misogynistic tone or speaking about how women are less than or speaking in a derogatory way um, about women or men um, needs to stop and needs to stop being normalized. So I'll start at the beginning. Um, the picture on the left is of me at some point in the 80s. Um, and the picture on the right is from a recent photo shoot that I did with my partner, um, Rebecca, uh, for a magazine shoot. Um, you can read what it says, but very briefly, um, I started my interest in art at a very young age. Um, my mom would probably contend that I started curating around the age of five or six. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C. and basically started going to museums from the time I was born, um, which probably has a lot to do with my current career path. Um, I heard recently that someone said that what you do as a child or what you're passionate about as a child is what you often end up doing as an adult, which I'm lucky uh, enough to say that I have pursued that. Um, when I was a kid, I was really interested in making art. Um, I attended the Corcoran School of Art. I did numbers of classes um, in the DC area. Um, I was, I think, a pretty good art maker. Um, I also not only did visual arts, but I also was a dancer. Um, I did Kuchipuri, which is a South Indian form of dance, traditional dance form, um, for 10 plus years. Um, and I got to perform all over the place um, as a young adult um, and as a teenager. Um, I think that was very foundational in my interest in South Asian culture and sort of my investment in being a first generation American South Asian woman, um, my investment in our community. Um, and that picture on the left is of me performing actually. When I got to high school, I was not the best student, I would say. Um, I had a lot of trouble concentrating. Um, eventually I was diagnosed with ADHD, which again, I'll talk a little bit about later, but I think which has become an asset in my life as an adult. Um, and as someone who works on multiple projects, at least I like to take, tell myself that. Um, but I would say I'm fairly productive now. But as I found so much trouble concentrating, I was, like I said before, pretty abysmal at math and science. Um, I discovered art history. Um, and I took one class, I think when I was either a sophomore or junior in high school um, with an incredible professor named Mary Lou Wood. Um, and it really changed my perspective on how I learned, how I absorbed information, how I was able to understand things visually and through a process of understanding the context and the history. Um, and through doing that, I really think that changed my academic career. Um, and I took one course, and I was just in love with the discipline, with not just the art aspect, because I was an art maker and an object maker, but also with the process of learning visually. Um, and so from that, I actually petitioned to do another art history course as an independent study. Um, I ended up taking three history courses at the same time and opting out of another course. I won't say which one. Um, in case I don't want to encourage people to opt out of courses, but for me, it worked. Um, and I joke with people and say that I knew from an early age, but I really knew in high school that I wanted to be an art historian and involved in the art history realm. 
Um, and I'm one of the few people who went to, uh, who pursued their undergraduate major for me, that was art history. And I went from high school into college. I knew exactly where I wanted to go. Um, I applied early and knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, or so I thought I knew I did not want to make art any longer. Um, but I knew that I wanted to work in the art industry. So while I was in college, I started working professionally. Um, I went to New York University for both my undergrad and my graduate degrees. And while in New York City, I had just this wealth of opportunities to work at various art institutions because New York is one of the biggest art hubs. Um, so while I was in school, I started working at prominent South Asian galleries. I worked at Christie's Auction House. I worked at Bospasia Gallery, which was the foremost gallery um, at that time showing, actually the only gallery showing art from the South Asian subcontinent. Um, and then I also worked for a variety of more mainstream art galleries and foundations, including the Judd Foundation um, here in New York. So following graduation, I um, joined another South Asian gallery, I'm sorry, an Asia, East Asian gallery um, in the Chelsea Art District. And that was around 2008, 9-ish. Um, and while I was there, the financial market crashed, which had, as I'm sure all of you know, a multitude of effects on basically everyone in the world um, and had huge ripple effects. For me, I think, I don't know where I've gotten it from. I would say I get it from my parents. I, I like to think of myself as being very adaptable and making the best out of a not so great situation. Um, and when the gallery I was working for started laying people off, I took the opportunity to start my own project. Um, at this point, it was late 2009, early 2010. Um, I was really struggling to figure out what I wanted to do. I was at that point already sort of tired of working in the commercial gallery world um, because I felt like it didn't really give me enough space to sort of flex my intellectual side and my interest in um, art history as an intellectual endeavor. It was a lot about simply just selling work. And so when I was laid off, um, I had the opportunity to work remotely um, with my family's business, which was a really, which really basically helped me survive um, and also taught me a lot of valuable skills about marketing and how to brand and put myself out there. And at the same time, I started a project called Project for Empty Space. Um, which started out as a nomadic project in Manhattan's Lower East Side, which is where I was living at the time. Um, and this project basically started out as just an idea. Um, I think very naively, people always laugh when I say this, I was very sort of starry-eyed and naive. And I was like, how can I make a project happen somewhere in New York City who would be the person to call? And so I, my um, co-founder, Manakshi Therakode, another really incredible curator, South Asian curator who now lives in London, we were like, let's call 311, the information hotline in New York City and see how they could help us. Um, and this is the part that people laugh at because 311 and information hotlines are, I think, notorious for giving you basic information, not being really all that helpful. Um, so I called them and I said, I would like to do an outdoor art project. Does, is there any place in the city that we can do this? I didn't think to go to the Department of Parks or the Department of Cultural Affairs. I just, for some reason, called 311 and, you know, God bless the woman who picked up the phone that day. 
because she said, oh yeah, sure, um, I'll connect you with someone, which I don't think she was supposed to do, but she did. And we ended up with uh, the space that you see on the left, which was a very narrow alleyway in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, it was basically a dump, but the city leased it to us for $0 um, for one year. And within that year, the artist that we invited, Taneeth Masood, who is a Pakistani artist who had moved about six years ago, or six years before that, to the States. Um, we had, we cleaned out the space with her and she made this incredible piece that you see on the left. Um, I'm sorry, it's such a small image. That was about the history of the neighborhood um, and the architectural history of the neighborhood. And while she did that, the neighbors who were adjacent to this little alleyway asked us if we would stay. Um, our plan had been to do, you know, the six month long installation art piece um, and then, you know, move on. It was sort of this one time thing. And so we were like, OK, sure. So we stayed for another six months. And then they said, will you please stay again? Um, and at that point, we decided that it would behoove us to make this organization more formal and give it some sort of formal structure because we were interacting with the community in a way that was scalable. And at the same time, people from other cities started to approach us. Um, you know, by, I like to say that a lot of my, uh, professional development and where I've gotten today has been a combination of really hard work and hustle, but also um, a lot of good luck and great circumstances. Um, this project, the first project that we ever did happened to be picked up by the Wall Street Journal. Um, and I think I was 25 or 26. Um, and being in the Wall Street Journal at that age, having a full page article really, I think, pushed us to make this project scalable. Um, so we basically were approached by other curators and other communities and other cities, and we started to do these temporal, temporary projects um, that engage in dialogue with the community where one artist and then the three curators, Minakshi, um, the curator who we're collaborating with and myself, ended up making this project in response to what the community was interested in. Um, and that went on for several years. In 2013, my now uh, business partner, Rebecca Jampol, had been working in Newark and she had read about us in the Wall Street Journal. I had known her for a few years, sort of in a social ancillary kind of way. And she had, this project in Newark um, where she had been working for about 10 years. And it was in a vacant office space. Um, and it was at that time, 14,000 14, square feet. And she really needed help with it. She wanted to collaborate um, in this space. And so we said, sure, sounds like a great idea. Our, again, this is sort of where luck and circumstance come into play. Um, our one sort of, four week project ended up turning into two years of projects um, between us, between the three of us. Um, eventually, Minakshi wanted to go to grad school. She moved back to India for a bit and then went to London. Um, so she occasionally contributes conceptual ideas to us, but one, one project turned into two years of programming and at that point, our patrons, the owners of the building that we're now in, said they had an interest in the space um, where we were doing these pop-up shows and they wanted to know if we would be able to have a sustainable project there. And um, as with many things that I do and that with what Rebecca does, we said yes, um, because the opportunity was so great and sort of tried to figure out how it would work out afterwards. Um, it was important for us to just seize that opportunity. So what we ended up doing was 
taking all the space that we had. And you can sort of see in the picture on the right um, that it was very much so an office space. It had these weird blue carpets and drop ceilings. Um, it had kind of gross lighting. Um, you know, it was a corporate, corporate office space. So what we did was we actually ripped everything out. Let me see. Um, we ripped everything out. You can see in the picture on the left a little bit that we now have this white box gallery. We have 22 foot ceilings instead of eight foot ceilings. Um, and we added on 56 artist studios, which we now rent, which goes to the sustainability of our project. Um, and so the idea, eventually we called the entire project Gateway Project Spaces, which is our studios, and then Project for Empty Space, which is my older nonprofit, we gave it sort of a permanent home, um, which is now where we cultivate the same idea that we've always had in sort of a permanent white box space. And the reason we wanted to have a white box space was, I can't see you, so I'm just gonna ask you to think about this, but was to break down the barrier um, that a lot of people, particularly people of color, um, people of lower socioeconomic backgrounds have about going into the museum space. Um, again, since I can't see you, I'm just going to have to sort of guess, but I'm guessing that a lot of people have have felt, in my experience, I've noticed that a lot of people of color have felt unwelcome into the museum space or the institutional space, um, which is not an accident. Um, museum spaces and galleries were traditionally built as spaces for a very specific demographic of people. Um, Rebecca and I do not believe in that. We believe in equitability for all. We believe that all spaces should be safe spaces for everyone. Um, and so our goal in having a white box space is to try and either subvert or get rid of the stigma about the white box space. So where we are is a very prominent space in Newark in the train station. We have about 30,000 people pass by a day and we put up exhibitions that are not only beautiful, but they are also are very thought provoking. Um, they're not always easy. Um, we do a lot of work around intersectionality, which I'm going to define, define very shortly, um, as well as social issues. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll come back to that in a little bit, but uh, to wrap up sort of my bio, I also, um, in addition to teaching and running Project Firmty Space and Gateway Project Spaces um, and doing activist work, I was on the board of the South Asian Women's Creative Collective. I have worked with the Girls Educational Mentoring Services Group, which helps rehabilitate um, young women who have been victims of domestic sex trafficking. Um, I also curate independently. Um, and my work has been featured in a number of publications, um, which you can see on my website. I'm not going to talk about them. Um, but that's basically who I am. <clears throat> Very quickly, because I am not sure how I'm doing on time. Um, okay, I'm okay on time. Um, I'll talk about being an independent curator. Um, so as I said, I run this big space, but before I ran it, and also while I'm still running it, I do a number of independent projects that mostly speak to um, things that are very personal to me. So those things are being female, um, being South Asian American, or being brown, um, standing up for women's rights, um, exploring the importance of um, being, strong and being an advocate for women. And so a few of the shows I've done uh, are presented here on this slide. Um, my shows generally have a, a mix of gravitas or seriousness. They address serious issues, but also a bit of humor as well. And um, I like to make them challenging. Um, the 
image on the top left is from an exhibition I did called The Least Orthodox Goddess. Um, and I want to touch on this briefly because I, the image you see is of me, um, a very photoshopped version of me and a much younger version of me. Um, but I like to think that people still know it's me. Um, and it was shot in a church as part of this project called um, the Unsuitable Girls series, which has been an ongoing project for now about 15 years, where the photographer and other artists, the photographer is Anjali Pargava, and um, the other artist is Swathi Karana. They invite women um, who are women of color, predominantly South Asian women, from their local community, their friends, um, friends of friends, to self-nominate as, um, I wouldn't say negative, but un non-traditional labels. Um, and so the purpose of this project is in the same way that the idea of badass brown chick is a way to circumvent or dismantle the idea of uh, a model minority or of a particular parameter within which women of color have to exist, it sort of tries to disrupt that. And so um, some of the other examples have been the least suitable mother, where there is a woman surrounded by books, drinking a glass of wine um, while also holding her baby. There's been the least dutiful wife, which is uh, a friend of mine who was shot in a really messy apartment. So they're tongue in cheek, um, but I think that they're also very powerful. So when they asked me to participate, um, because I'm, I like to think of myself as a bit of a diva, uh, I said, I wanna do uh, the least orthodox goddess, which again, speaks to this idea of being unconventional, but being strong and having power. Um, and they came up with the idea of shooting the image in a church, which was kind of brilliant. I felt that um, it really disrupted our perceptions of basically everything. Um, and this, pic this picture has been included in several exhibitions, um, not only my own, but from this experience of working with them, I crafted an exhibition, um, which has now become an exhibition series that has had many iterations, um, again, around the world. It's been shown in Philadelphia, in New York, in Miami. Um, I have plans hopefully to show it in India and a few other places. Each time it's slightly different, but the sort of overarching theme is the same. Um, one other exhibition that I want, two others that I want to touch on really briefly are um, a show called And the Falchion Passed Through His Neck, which has to date been the only show that I've done so far in Delhi, um, which is where my family is originally from. And this show um, was, again, about women's empowerment and about how portrayals of uh, strength, often through violence, um, or what is perceived to be violence or aggression, are symbols of a new type of female power. Um, when I did this show, I would say I was rather naive um, about the content of the show, and I got a, not, a lot of negative feedback from the community. I think it was the first time that I received really um, harsh criticism. And the criticism was not so much about the work, but about the concept that I was addressing. Um, a lot of people asked why we needed to have a concept like this that addressed female empowerment. Um, and I realized at that point how important it was to be assertive um, as a brown woman um, and to make sure that people heard my voice and the voice of people who are like me and to express our grievances, but also to express our strengths um, and our accomplishments. So I think in the face of all that criticism, it was really difficult to hear um, to hear some of that feedback, it was disheartening, not only as a curator, but also just to hear that people felt that these types of voices, um, my voice didn't need to be 
heard. Um, and I think really that was pushed me in a direction of doing more sort of female empowerment oriented shows. Um, the last one I want to touch on is the bottom left. Um, it the still is from Sama Al Shaibi. Um, and I put on a show at Art Basel Miami, which is a big art fair that happens every year. Um, that was not for sale. It was just an exhibition. And I included, I still don't remember the exact number, but I think about 30 women artists from South Asia and the Middle East and the diasporas um, in a show that was simply to highlight the work that we do. Um, and I didn't tell anyone that all the women were from this region or that they were all women. Um, it was a really powerful show that ended up traveling. Um, and I guess the point of why I'm showing this is, well, there's two points. One, I did this show, I think when I was 26, maybe 26 or 27. So I was pretty young. Um, and also, just to share that there are spaces that we can be in um, and we don't have to be sort of otherized or necessarily claim what we're doing as a facet of um, what makes it special, but simply to just exist. We can exist in spaces. We just have to sort of push around and make the room for ourselves. So, on owning a gallery, um, definitely not the most traditional career path. Um, people have told me that I am one of one um, of, I guess, prominent, independent, um, South Asian American brown gallery owners. Uh, I think I am actually the only um, South Asian American gallery owner in the New York area, um, which is surprising um, and certainly the only female. Um, so a few quick things about our space. Like I said, and it said in the mission, it is about creating equitable space for both artists as well as audiences. Our ultimate goal is to engage people in conversation around social, important social issues. Um, again, we have nomadic projects that happen. Um, one of my favorite new programs, two of them are, we have a new feminist incubator program in which we invite four artists to apply. Uh, I'm sorry, we invite many artists to apply and we pick four and they're invited to work in this giant gallery space that we have and put on an exhibition and also have access to a lot of resources, including our feminist reading lounge, um, which is open to the public. We recently got a very large donation of books, which is really exciting. Um, and they are books that range from novels. They're not just books, they're um, material that range from novels to scholarly material to audiobooks. Um, and it's not about sort of pushing a particular rigid agenda, but it's just for people to see what women in power are doing and to sort of be inspired by that and learn how other people can sort of adopt those habits and methodologies and get into the world. So I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about, let me just check my time. Okay. And talk about intersectional feminism and leadership, which is really, I've spent so much time talking about myself, but it's really what I wanted to talk about with all of you. Um, intersectional feminism, again, I can't see all of you, so I'm just going to explain it, and I'm sorry if this is redundant, um, is the following. If feminism, and this is a, a quote that I've adapted from elsewhere, but I think it's a it hits the nail on the head. If feminism is advocating for women's rights and equality between the sexes, intersectional feminism is the understanding of how women's overlapping identities, including race, class, ethnicity, religion, and sexual orientation, as well as ability, which they did include, impact the way we experience oppression and discrimination. 
The term intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. She is, if you don't know her work, an incredible civil rights advocate, lawyer, professor, um, and leading scholar of critical race theory. Now, all of us, and this is, if, if you walk away with nothing else from today, um, I'd like it if you remember this. All of us as people are multifaceted. None of us are just one thing. I am not just a woman, just like I'm not just South Asian American. I am not a straight female only, or I'm not just straight, but I'm also female. Um, so all of us have these multiple layers that make up who we are. And in many situations, these layers of our identities work in a way that puts us, that could put us at a further disadvantage. And the example that Kimberly Crenshaw uses, it's not outdated, but what she uses in defining what intersectional feminism is an example from um, a legal case in which, uh, in a factory, a series of black women workers were had wage discrimination. And they wanted to get equal pay to everyone else. And when the trial went to court, it turns out that they were getting paid both less than their white counterparts, also less than their black male counterparts. When they took the case to court, the court didn't know whether to try it as a case of racial discrimination or gender discrimination, not realizing that it should be tried as both. So from this, Crenshaw saw the need for there to be a new category that identified the various types of discrimination as they're layered on top of each other. Now, I will contend that intersectionality can be something that affects us negatively, but is also something that we can use as an asset to moving forward. So briefly, um, the picture on the right is from me at a protest um, with some friends, all of different races, sexual orientations, backgrounds. Um, so these are my, some of my identities um, that really shape who I am. I am South Asian American. I wear size 14 clothes. I am not your sort of typical gallery girl, skinny model. Um, I am American. I'm also South Asian. I am brown. I was born female. Um, I'm heterosexual. I am a college graduate. I run a business. Um, and one thing, okay, one other thing I said, I wanted you to take one thing away, but one other thing I want you to take away from this is that your identities are your own. Um, I'm sure many of you, as I have felt, um, in navigating this world have had identities imposed onto me by other people. Their perceptions of me are, oh, you're exotic. Oh, you're female. Yes, I'm female, but um, people make assumptions. Um, they have uh, implicit bias. That's a term you should look up if you don't know what it means. Um, people come to the table with all sorts of assumptions about other people. That's just how human nature. But what you should remember is that the only person who can truly define you is you. Um, so I'll leave it at, at that. You you are you, you own who you are, you have agency, um, and no one else can tell you who you are but you. And it took me a very long time um, to understand that. I don't think that I truly understood that until I was an adult, um, which is why I tell it to you to sort of ruminate on. Um, so these are some of my policies as someone who considers herself an intersectional leader. Um, one of the biggest things, um, which has recently been on my mind, is everyone must get paid equally for equal work. Um, men and women, people of color, everyone must get compensated equally. 
not knowing English or speaking accented English is not a measure of intelligence or unintelligence. Um, I've seen this happen really frequently, especially now that I'm a professor, that students who speak accented English or English is maybe a second or another language for them, it's not their first language, are treated differently. Um, that is not right, it's not fair, um, and it's very short-sighted. Um, so no matter what your first language is, is it's irrelevant. Um, and then the, not the last thing, but uh, the last thing here is everyone, no matter what their position in their community, in their company, wherever they are, must be treated with respect. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you sound like or smell like. Um, everyone deserves to be treated with respect, whether it is the person cleaning my gallery or it is the multi million dollar collector. People are people. So the last slide on intersectional leadership is the idea that we must not only acknowledge our differences, but we have to embrace them. If we, even though people have not necessarily conscientiously done this, what makes what we all do, no matter what industry we're in, um, what makes things successful, what makes endeavors successful is ideas, different ideas, diverse ideas. And people can only contribute a sort of rainbow of ideas because they come from different perspectives and different backgrounds. So within that, I will say using people's differences and using their variety of perspectives is what will make you grow. It will, it will be what projects you into the future. So if you are a person who is maybe different, different than what the normative is, use that to your advantage. Use that to propel yourself and introduce new ideas and um, what may seem sort of mundane or regular to you could really be novel and exciting for someone else. Okay. Ah, I'm running out of time. I was running out of time. Um, so here are some of the obstacles that I have faced um, growing up and becoming a leader. I'll run through them really quickly so you don't have to spend time reading them. Um, I was very shy growing up. Um, and I think I was underconfident. I think a lot of that may have had to do with looking different from everyone else coming from a different background. Um, obviously I've overcome that, uh, being different has, is part of my brand now. Um, being young or being precocious versus being pretentious, um, do not ever let anyone tell you your, your ideas are bad or less than, um, or they're pretentious because you are young. Young people have the best ideas, the most innovative ideas. Do not let someone use your age against you. Um, I did not get to where I am, and I'm still pretty young for my industry, um, by sort of stopping um, myself or being afraid of sharing my ideas just because I was young. Um, I won't actually go through all of these. You can, you can read them. Um, but I will touch on being a leader, um, or owning a business as a young female. Um, I encounter a lot of people who don't believe that I own a business. Um, I encounter a lot of people who, uh, scoff at it or say awful things about it. At the end of the day, I own a business and most likely, more likely than not, they don't. So own, own what you do, own who you are. So now how we can use intersectional identities in opposition of oppression. Um, I think we can realize that there are a lot of things that are unfair in the world. Um, that is, simply just how life is. But if you acknowledge that, you can overcome it. 
um, you know, they say recognizing you have a problem is the first step to a solution. I don't know if that's the exact verbiage, but you get the idea. Um, so understanding that things are unfair and then moving beyond that is really important. Identifying things that are intrinsically important, um, non-negotiable as our values, um, what we stand for, doing what we love, and then making those things happen is really important. Um, you know, you cannot move forward with ideas and goals if you haven't identified what they are yet. Understanding that intelligence and creativity are assets to who you are and never anything to be ashamed of. Again, this goes back to the idea of ageism or sort of naysayers. Um, your, your abilities will push you to the farthest point. Don't let anyone try and diminish your sparkle or your shine. Those are the things that make you who you are and those are the things that will make you successful. And that goes to the next point. These are some things that are, I think, a little cliche, but they are so, so important. Um, they are things that have I have really taken to heart um, in my adult life. And that is, you've all, I'm sure, seen magazines like Vogue or just general magazines, you've seen media, um, you've seen sort of a lack of representation, I'm sure, of different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different body types. What you have to understand is that these do not reflect the real world. They reflect a very specific agenda. Um, you know, as someone who has been in Vogue before, I will tell you that I, if you flip through those pages, I look nothing like anyone else in there. And for me, that's actually kind of amazing. I am the unique voice in a major publication. Um, so I will say that recognizing that being black and brown is beautiful. Um, love yourself and love yourself in spite of whatever anyone says the normal is. Recognize that the beauty standards, not only in, in this country, but in the world now, um, because of social media, which is a whole other seminar that I could give. Um, beauty standards, like I just spoke about, are false. Um, that's really is true. And then again, it's gonna sound redundant now because I've said it so many times, but recognizing that my perspectives and your perspectives as first generation, um, or even if you're not first generation, as a person of a different background, gives you multiple perspectives. Um, I have a friend who's an academic who says it is uh, multi-positional, meaning your experience in the world coming from a multitude of different cultures actually gives you a really well-rounded perspective on the world. It gives you the ability to think critically from multiple viewpoints. That is a gift. It's something to be embraced. It's something that will allow you to empathize with other people in ways that, uh, that other people who don't have multifaceted or pluralistic backgrounds may not be able to. So that is something that will, the ability to think critically and recognize um, the similar experiences in other people is something that will take you really far. So before I spoke a little bit about how I uh, was diagnosed with ADHD in high school, I will say now that it is something that has worked to my advantage. Um, the school structure, the college, not the college structure, the school structure or like the regular workday structure of nine to five is something very specific. Um, the way that we learn and move through a school day is fairly rigid. Um, however, it is not necessarily how the real world works. Um, and I realized when I got to college that I can navigate my assignments, I can do my work in ways that work for me. Um, so rather than having to adapt to a system, I let the system adapt to me. 
Um, you know, when I work now as a curator, I have 10 million ideas all the time. What I do is I write them down. Um, and I think that the, the gift of being ADHD um, really just means I have the ability to constantly have creative ideas coming in. And as long as I've built an instructor to remember those ideas, I go really far. Um, that is really how I've gotten to where I am is by having this ability to fluidly navigate um, the world every day. Um, and then with that understanding that being I being able to be presented with problems and then think creatively about how they can be solved is a really great privilege. Um, and this goes back to looking at multi-positionality or looking at having multiple different backgrounds to propel you to think about things from multi multiple viewpoints as a way to come up with solutions and creative solutions. Um, Every time I'm posed with a challenge or a problem, which is basically every day in the business world, um, I sit down and I jot down every single possible solution. And I do this with Rebecca and we say, we usually all of our, the first hour or the first however long, all of our ideas are terrible, they're garbage. But then as we get flowing, they something sticks. Um, and this is a process that we practice, again, almost every day. And it's because both of us acknowledge how different we are and how many layers we have and how many perspectives we come with, come to the table with. And that is really what um, makes us solution and goal oriented. So I have... I have to apologize. I didn't make this list as long as I could have. I will add some more people in the comments. I completely left out Bell Hooks. Oh, no, I didn't. She's there. Okay, never mind. Um, but these are some people, some links that you should check out. Um, you can click on them, I think, after um, this is over. Um, some of the artists who are in here, their work has been presented throughout the presentation. Um, Again, I have so many more links to add. Um, my contact information is at the end. I'm so happy to share all of my lists um, with anyone who is interested in them. As someone who teaches intersectional feminism, um, I have literally pages upon pages of resources and books that I'm happy to share. This was a little interactive part. Um, I don't know if it will work now that we're in different presentation mode, but I would say do this for yourself. Um, in the face of naysayers and haters, I was hoping that everyone could write their responses in, um, but I'll say what my answer is, is that no matter what, I own myself, I own my body, I own my beauty, and I own both my successes and my failures. My failures are really what have kind of shaped how I have moved forward in life. Yes, successes are great, but what is it that we learn from our failures and how can we improve upon uh, how we act and how we work um, in light of those failures? So almost a little over time, but I will finish up with this. Um, there is no such thing as a binary or two-part circumstance or identity when it comes to people. Um, I keep telling you this is the last thing I want you to take away, but this really is the last thing I want you to take away. Um, people are complicated. It is just our nature. In order to make a difference in the world, in order towards in order to lead people towards change, you have to recognize that no one is flat. Everyone is multi-layered. No one is inherently good or bad. Nothing is, sim is simply black or white, left or right. Even in physics, classic relativity is only a theory. Recognize that in every situation, there are nuances and gray areas. With that in mind, you can learn to be empathetic to others, to be kind to yourself and to let others and yourself make mistakes that lead you to your evolution as a smarter, stronger leader. 
do not hold anything in. Um, this is something that I've come to lately um, in just being sort of filterless and not not being polite if I feel that something wrong is being done and speaking my mind. This is something I've learned from my mother. Um, and I think it's really important. So do not hold anything in. If you feel thrilled about accomplishments, share them. It's not bragging. You've earned it. If something negative has happened, do not be ashamed. Share it and live without regrets. I tell this to my students and my peers all the time. Unless you truly hate who you are as a human being, you can't really have regrets because everything that has happened to you makes you who you are. Now, that's not to say that you can't feel bad about things that have happened or talk about them or let them let sort of pain um, be present because acknowledging pain is important. But just know that what has happened happens, maybe not for a reason, but it does make you who you are in a really great way. So if you can pivot your perspective to understand that you are amazing, then nothing that has happened is for naught. Learn to listen. Do not just hear what people are saying, but actually listen and engage with them. Being a good leader means that you give people what they need and you only can understand what people need if they tell you and you actually absorb that. It's okay to cry. Catharsis is key to getting through life relatively unscathed. Um, really quickly, anecdotally, I had a presenter in class a few weeks ago um, who presented really powerful performance art that was really uh, visceral and um, really heartfelt. And all 13 of my adult students were crying at the end, some of them hysterical. And I was like, I am going to get fired. I don't know. I did not expect this. I knew it was an emotional piece, but I didn't expect that. Um, and after the class, all 13 of them independently wrote me thank you notes because they said it was really what they needed to just release some of the tension they had at, you know, at the mid semester point. So it is okay to get upset. I frequently have meltdowns. Um, and then I feel great afterwards. And finally, a mantra. And this is a little cheesy, but I actually say this to myself every day. Not in these exact words, but no matter what, I own myself. I have agency in this world. I have privilege. I own this body. This is my gift and my burden. I own my beauty. I own my successes and my failures and everything in between. I am powerful. I am a badass brown chick. And with that, here's where you can find me. Um, again, please feel free to email me, to find me on Instagram. Um, I'm happy to talk to any of you and share more of my experiences. I love to talk and could talk for hours. I lecture for a living sometimes. So um, please feel free to reach out. Oop. And now I will take your questions. Let me... Uh, Amina, should I turn the screen share off? Should I leave it on? Uh, we can leave it on. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I was going to say uh, thank you for all your presentation. It was so uplifting. Oh, I'm, sure, I'm sure our viewers took uh, a lot of lessons from it. Uh, and I had a question. Um, sure. You spoke about different... You spoke about having different intersectional identities. Mm -hmm. So how how do how does having that affect your leadership styles? That's a great question. Um, I think acknowledging my various identities um, is really what helps me define who I am and define how I interact with people. 
Um, I think one of my identities, I would say, is South Asian American or brown. And I feel that acknowledging that helps me interact or be cognizant of what other people who have that same identity are going through and gives me an ability to talk to people who share that identity. Um, I think part of being a leader is understanding yourself and loving yourself. Um, you know, the phrase, you can't, you can't love anybody else unless you truly love yourself. Um, and part of that is understanding how your various different identities come together to make one and make you who you are. I don't know if that answers the question. It does. It does. And uh, I, I, I love that response. And, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like people don't embrace their identities and they don't use them to move forward and rather they use their identities to hold them back. So I think that was really good that you brought it out. Thank you. Yeah, I I think it's so important um, to understand that who you are and the, the things, the identities or the qualities that make you different are really what make you special. Um, and it took me a really long time to understand that conforming to what everyone else's standard is, is kind of boring. It's it's great to be different. Yeah. So uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, we're going to wait for some more questions and uh, we're going to move on from there. You can ask me anything. <laughs> Hi, Jasmine. Hey, Amina. Hi. Uh, given actually that we're over time by quite a bit, um, I would love to let people email you directly, Jasmine, or they can email sure. us at uh, info at speakmentorship.org. We're always looking for questions for our speakers, and we can always connect you as well. So uh, I'm sure. Oh, actually, you know what? Uh, Natalia does have a question. So, Amina, I'll let you answer I'll let you ask uh, Natalia's question and Jasmine can answer and then we'll definitely close out since we're over time. And please okay. do get in touch with Jasmine since she is willing to connect and do get in touch with us as well so we can then um, connect you further with Jasmine and other speakers. Amina? Okay, so Natalia is asking, how does she bring out her leadership potential? Potential, yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I think the first thing is, again, um, I sound like I'm sort of like a broken record, but identify the things that make you unique and special and then look for people who may be struggling, who are, even if they're not in the sort of same um, of the same background, but people who are struggling with that and use your voice to be a voice for them. Um, I think part of what is important about being a leader is giving voice to people who may not necessarily have it. And so the first step to that is listening to other people. And then the second step is once you've listened is sharing what they may not have a voice to share or the um, confidence to share, you share that for them. You become an advocate. I think the most important thing about being a leader is advocating for other people. Um, and so the sort of pragmatic answer to that is share your stories, share your willingness to listen um, everywhere from social media to if you have a blog to just simply telling your friends or your peers um, that you are there to listen to them and you are willing to share their stories. I mean, being a good leader comes really from starting to listen. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Jasmine. And just a few closing remarks. Uh, please join us next month on November 18th. We're going to have Krupa Johnny talk to us about uh, cultivating your passions. I feel like uh, this is going to be interesting given the discussion that we had today. So uh, from us at Speak Mentorship, that's it for today. Please follow us on social media and connect with Jasmine too. We're looking forward to hearing from you and getting some feedback. Thank you.
Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.